Hello BookTube. I wanted to do a page 112 tag for you. I recently saw that Brian at Bookish did one, uh, and I really enjoyed it. And uh, <laughs> totally by random chance, uh, the YouTube algorithm suggested on the side of his video one of my own page 112 tag videos, the first one that I ever did. Uh, and and my old pointer, Malin Moore, was right next to me on the couch in what had to be the last full day of her life. And that has, uh, without a, no fault of, of Brian, it has put me into a bit of a funk. Uh, so I thought I'd do a page 112 tag to use you to make me feel better, which I often do. Uh, and for those of you who, who might not know what that is, it was created by Sean the Book Maniac. And it's an adaptation of a literary prize in France where the judges judge which books will get on the long list only on page 112 of the manuscript. No title page, no author information, no nothing. Just page 112. Under the assumption that most manuscripts are heavily worked over in the first few chapters and that by page 112 uh, that's not so tight and you will see the author at work more directly. Which I've often found to be true, so I, I kind of like this approach. And I also like it because uh, here on BookTube, adapted for books, the, the adaptation that, that Sean originally came up with is that you pick three books and read one page 112 and then assess. And the thing I like about that BookTube uh, adaptation is that it's a very good exercise for uh, seeing text, for analyzing text. I, I really like that. So I thought we'd go through three together and, and here's hoping that the algorithm is more merciful to me tomorrow than it was today. Uh, so I'm gonna read you th page 112 of three books uh, and I want you to be paying attention uh, the whole time to what you don't like and what you do like, what you would read more of and what you wouldn't. Uh, all the stuff that those judges, I imagine, pay attention to. Uh, and once again, I won't be completely strict about page 112. Like, for instance, this first one that we're going to read. These are all novels. This is all fiction. And this first one we're going to read is a scene, and the scene begins just a couple of lines before page 112. So I'm going to read that first. Uh, this is... Uh, uh, a busy salon full of people. That's the setting. Uh, I'd hoped you would be you would be here this evening, Your Grace. Rebecca's grin was ridiculously wide, and she performed a perfect curtsy, one from which she did not need to be rescued. Delilah noted with mild pique. I bet you did. Delilah mumbled under her breath. What's that? Rebecca asked, frowning. Nothing. Delilah forced a smile to her lips. Delilah watched them together. She tried to picture how Thomas must see her friend. Rebecca was a beautiful young woman, well-mannered, good family. No doubt she was precisely the type of young woman Thomas should marry. And Rebecca definitely seemed enamored of Thomas. Delilah had simply never thought about it before. Thomas, her friend, her closest friend, falling in love and marrying someone else, a woman. <laughs> Perhaps he'd been, she'd been terribly naive not to envision this moment, but she'd somehow thought she and Thomas would go on forever, as they always had, talking and laughing and ribbing each other. She'd matchmake, and he'd avoid marriage, and they'd both grow old together. It wasn't that she'd planned for it to happen that way. It was only that she hadn't specifically considered it happening any other way. Delilah watched them with narrowed eyes as Rebecca laughed at Thomas's jests and reached out to touch his sleeve twice. She also noted that Rebecca did not rattle off poorly pronounced nonsensical French, nor did she rip any of Thomas's clothing. How a courtship should be, Delilah thought, with an intense chagrin. Uh, and we can, you can see from that, uh, it's it's uh, fairly light, fairly frothy prose. Uh, but right in the middle of that if, of that kind of friendly scene, I think you can you can probably infer from that scene that when Delilah notices that her friend does, did not fall in the middle of a curtsy, she's reflecting on the fact that she herself has done that. When Delilah notices that her friend doesn't rattle off nonsensical French or rip clothing by accident, she's clearly referring to herself doing that, uh, and is kind of at the one time, at the same time, simultaneously envying her friend and also disliking the fact that she comes off so poorly. But right in the middle of that, of that fun, you know, friendly scene, there's that wonderful bit about how she just assumed that things would always be the same between her and her friend and that they would just grow old doing that. And it's, it's a neat little moment, excuse me, a neat little moment, I thought, of the real world impinging. Uh, so that, excuse me, that was... Uh, Excerpt number one. Now I'll move on to uh, to excerpt number two, and I, I will do a grand reveal of all three of these at the end. Uh, and once again, I will read the scene, uh, not just, you know, strictly page 112. I'm not going to start in the middle of a word or anything like this. And by coincidence, 
Uh, this is the beginning of a story. This page one and twelve is this is the start of a story. Uh, the robot shuffled clank clank into the pitch dark of the bedroom, then stood staring down at the humans. The female human groaned and rolled away and folded a pillow over her head. Gale, honey, said the male, licking dry lips. Mother has a headache. Could you take that noise out of here? I can provide a stimulating cup of coffee, <laughs> boomed the robot in an emotionless voice. Tell her to get out, Raymond, said the female. My head is exploding. Gale, go on. You can hear mother isn't herself, said the male. You are incorrect. I have scanned her vitals. I have identified her as Sylvia London. She is herself. <laughs> the robot tilted her head to one side, inquisitively, waiting for more data. The pot on her head fell off and hit the floor with a great steely crash. Mother sat up screaming. It was a wretched, anguished, human sound with no words in it, and it frightened the robot so much that for a moment she forgot she was a robot and she was just Gale again. Then she snatched her pot off the floor and hurried clangity clang clang to the relative safety of the hall. Uh, and again, that is very that is was very slim, very lean, very engaging prose. Uh, I think you would keep reading if you read that scene. And also, there's the uh, there's the little the little twist there where the robot forgets for a minute that that it's a robot and remembers just being Gale. So you wonder right away when you're reading that passage, okay, is, is this a machine at all? Or is it a machine with a human mind somehow imprinted on it or imprisoned in it? Uh, and also, uh, the, the, there's a very slight element of humor, much like in the first excerpt, that's kind of well done. Not, not offensively in, ineffective. Uh, and then we'll do the third one. And then there'll be the grand reveal and we will talk about it all. Uh, uh, let's see here. The dance crowd dwindled. His date drifted off with her sister. He followed the boy down a dark road and blew his brains out. Velasquez Cruz held Claire's hips and steered her. Pimentel watched Dudley watch. Young Joan watched it all. She had small brown eyes. She wore glasses. She spoke Yiddish and French. She had long black hair with gray swirls. Gray hair at 15. Your call, benighted or possessed. Pimentel said, my captain has abridged the social code. I would not ask another man's woman to dance without first seeking permission. Dudley said, You're abri you abridged the officer's code of conduct, Lieutenant. Your comment is impolitic, however well put and well taken. Pimentel smiled. My captain appears to have misjudged you. You demand diffidence from your fellows. You offer loyalty and camaraderie in return. Young Joan walked out on the dance floor. She tapped Claire on the shoulder and cut in. Claire bowed and deferred. Velasquez Cruz and young Joan took up the beat. His hands went straight to her hips. Claire walked back to the table. Pimentel excused himself and walked off. Good lad. Such decorum. Claire pointed to Velasquez Cruz. I've seen him before. I know it. Dudley pointed to young Joan. She danced a mean rumba. How does she get by? She steals out of stores. She hasn't asked me for anything, but she appreciates the clothes I buy her. Dudley said, I'm going to have her tailed. They walked back to the hotel. Harbor lights blinked. Young Joan took Claire's arm. They mimicked the 19th century daguerreotypes. Faux Parisians stroll Saint-Germain. The Malacon cut inland. Shoreline hostelries loomed. They bucked a sea wind, three abreast. Alleyways bisected the, ga the sidewalk. Gas lamps lit narrow footprints. They walked single file. Claire said something. Young Joan slid on wet asphalt and went wee. A man stepped in front of them. He moved alleyway to lamplight. He was unkempt and looked dissolute. He verged on raggedy. He got, he's got a revolver. He's aiming it. It's a hand cannon. The hammer's cocked. He yelled slogans. They were nonsensical. He braced his gun arm and aimed straight ahead. Dudley pulled his piece. His arms fluttered. His aim fluttered. He fired two shots wide. The second man stepped out. He moved alleyway to lamplight. He's young and sleek. Note the twill shirt and armband. He's got a sawed-off shotgun. He tripped two triggers. Muzzle flare lit the load. Steel scraps, tight-packed, trench warfare slaughter weaponry. The slogan man blew up. Such blood you've never seen. The scraps disemboweled him. His gun arm severed and flew. <laughs> that is page 112 of this third book. And uh, you can tell a lot from that, right? 
I think uh, the one thing that you know, well, the first thing you know is, is the violence, of course, that, that because it's so extreme, uh, but also the the surgical nature of it. That that was just a staccato waterfall of short declared sentences. Uh, there was imagery involved, and I think the imagery was very eco economically done, very effectively done. I think you can see the scenes, both of them, and the fact that I could read so much just from page 112 is an indication of how much is packed on the page. Uh, so, for myself, uh, for my choices, as far as the ones that I like best, I would pick number three, first of all, and then number one, the scene in the salon, uh, even though it's much, much lighter prose. And only, uh, the th only number two would, number two would be third, uh, because although it was clever, it was also a little bit light. I mean, that, that was the, the shortest and easiest of the 112s that I that we read this time around. Uh, so I want to know what you think uh, of those excerpts. I, I, I hope I did a, a passable job reading them, uh, but I want to show you now what they are. Number one was a Regency romance by Valerie Bowman, who is an author I love, called No Other Duke But You. Uh, this is uh, the part of the Playful Brides series, and it came out at the end of April. Uh, so you have heard an excerpt from a Regency romance. Uh, and then this next one doesn't come out until October, right around Halloween. Uh, and it's Joe Hill. This is a, his new book uh, of short stories called Full Throttle. And the one that we read uh, was the beginning of a short story called By the Silver Water of Lake Champlain. Uh, and he is, uh, of course, he's Stephen King's son. Uh, and I'm, I'm pleased to say, you all know I don't have a very high opinion of Stephen King as an author at all. Uh, and I don't have a very high opinion of this author either, uh, based on the, the three of his three of his novels that I've read. Uh, his last book, Fireman. Uh, I don't know anybody that didn't love that book except for me. <laughs> and uh, the reason that it that it, that it kind of pleases me, the whole story of Joe Hill, it kind of pleases me, is that uh, the, first of all, the publishing world legend, the story, the myth that you would be quite simply foolish to believe, is that he submitted all of his early work blind and the, under the name Joe Hill, and that no one knew that he was Stephen King's son. That... <laughs> okay. Well, one way or another, whether you believe that story or not, the uncanny thing uh, that I have noticed about this author is that he has whatever talent Stephen King has. I certainly don't think his talent is literary. It's not on the page. But he does have, Stephen King does have an undeniable talent to connect directly with readers, which I cannot fault. He, Stephen King has been responsible for creating reading passion in more people in the 20th century than anybody aside from maybe Tom Clancy and Danielle Steele. He, he deserves all the credit for that. That is a talent, the same as anything else. And if you think it's easy, you should try it yourself. It's not. Uh, most writers that I know, whether they have literary talent or not, don't have that talent, whatever it is. And I firmly believe you can't learn that talent in a workshop, and you also can't inherit it. And Joe Hill has it. No doubt about it in my mind. None whatsoever. He has it. Same as his father. Don't know where it comes from. Maybe It must be a family thing. It must be from conversations. It, it can't be that it's unconnected that a father and son both have this talent. One way or another, I think you can sort of see it, even in that little excerpt that we, that we read, that, that uh, it's not good, you know, it's not standout excellent prose by any means, but you're involved right away. So I, fi I find that interesting. I find Joe Hill's career more interesting than I find his books, which I think means that I'm going to be going through a second generation of this. I felt that, I felt that same thing about Stephen King the whole of his career. I, I missed his first book, and I've and then went back and read it, and I've read everything since. I've read everything that he's ever written, from when he was an unknown author to a popular author to a cultural phenomenon. And the whole time, almost, with only a tiny exception here or there, uh, the whole time I've been far more interested in his career than I have been in his books. I don't think they're any good, most of them. Uh, and I think that I'm going to go through the same thing with Joe Hill for the next 60 years. <laughs> uh, and then the third one, uh, the third one comes out in June. It's right around the corner, and uh, it's This Storm by James Elroy. The author, uh, those of you who don't know the name, will certainly know uh, uh, Black Dahlia. You'll, you'll know the, uh, what, what was it? It was made into a Hollywood movie, right? Uh, oh, no, L.A. Confidential is the book of his that was made into a, a very successful movie adaptation. Uh, 
the movie adaptation didn't capture much of James Elroy other than what you saw in that excerpt, which is his freewheeling violence. His books are extremely violent on almost every page. Uh, the movie couldn't do that. The movie had to be a little more lush in its storytelling. It captured the violence a bit, but it mainly the main thing it captured from Elroy is the the uh, incredible slangy, catchy dialogue. I think that James Elroy is a master. I think he's a, one of the greatest. Uh, American writers working today and I, I the only reason that I hesitate and the reason why I bracket that with I think is because he's an extremely acquired taste so idiosyncratic a taste that I might actually be wrong <laughs> but he may actually this may actually be Dashiell Hammett style junk although Dashiell Hammett is commemorated with reprints and taught in schools so I don't know you know I, we should all be so unlucky as to be that one way or another I think there's more going on here than uh, than Dashiell Hammett or, or you know any of the hard boiled stuff that this obviously owes some kind of allegiance to. Uh, I think he's brilliant, just brilliant. I think the things that he can do on a page of prose are not the product of just scattershot throwing sentences down on the page. I think they're the product of Elmore Leonard style, exhaustive rewriting, and whittling. I think this is an author who whittles. Uh, I could be wrong about all that. I've never met him. I've never talked to him about his work. I've never read it. I don't, I don't typically read long interviews with authors either because I know from a fact from doing them how full of sheep dip they are. Instead, I've read his books, and I get the impression they seem to me to be whittled almost like haiku. Uh, but they are an acquired taste because they're extremely rough and extremely uh, unapologetic, <laughs> I guess would be a word. I, I, knowing this is coming out in June has been the light of my reading existence for months. It's, I think, a huge event when James Elroy has a new book, especially one as big and elaborate as this one. Uh, so, I don't know. It's, it's, it, all, the, there's, all three of these are tough. Uh, if I, Of course, it's no part of the page 112 tab to recommend books. Nevertheless, it's my whole life. <laughs> it's my whole life's purpose to recommend books to one degree or another or to actively warn you off them. And all three of these, <laughs> I don't know what to do about any of them. I mean, uh, this storm is an important book, I think. I think it's an important book. I think this is an important American author. I think it's a it's a cause for the literary world to sit up and take notice if he writes a new book. But he is such an acquired taste that not even all of the literary so-called establishment thinks that about him. I, I would be willing to bet that come June, this book will get scattershot review coverage, and that a lot of the reviews in major venues, like the Post or the Journal, will be fairly openly condescending. I'd be willing to bet that happens. I think it would be a drastic, drastic misservice, but we shall see. I will keep you apprised. And Joe Hill, I mean, what am I supposed to say again when it comes to recommending? Uh, if I thought that The Fireman was horrible, just horrible, plot holes you could drive a truck through, horrible, paper-thin characterization, all the evils that I fault Stephen King for. But if somebody you know, who's not maybe all that big a reader or who only likes what they like and isn't willing to have anything, doesn't want anything self-consciously literary or anything like that, and maybe they're laid up in a hospital and you, I had to get, I was, go, I was going to visit them and I had the gift shop to, to, to appeal to me, I might get horns or the fireman for such a person. I know they'll enjoy it. I know they'll keep turning the pages. I know that will happen. So in a circumstance where a recommendation wants to stress that, where that's important, <laughs> <laughs> so I've got I've got two that I, that I can't wholeheartedly recommend. I think that James Elroy is great, but I would hesitate to recommend this book to just anybody. I, I would have to know a lot about their reading history because there's no point in recommending it if it's totally going to grind the gears of the muscles that you already have in place. Uh, uh, and <laughs> Joe Hill's the same way. I can I could recommend the book knowing you will like it and just suspend the hour-long rant about why you shouldn't, and <laughs> what good, what good would that do? And then there's the last is Valerie Bowman, and again, I can recommend her. I've read, I think, every novel that she's ever written, and they're fantastic. When it comes to Regency romances, she is great. She does a great job. She doesn't sell them short. She doesn't write them dumb, and there are wonderful moments like the one that we read in every one of her books, many of them. Uh, and she also writes older characters well, which is always nice in a Regency, because they're the natural foil for the character, the main characters, so it's always nice to find a writer who writes them well. Uh, but anyway, so so that is a page 112 tag. I, I'm not sure that it has any out-of-the-park recommendations for anybody, just blanket recommendations. Uh, but it, it, it served to get 
to get uh, me a little more balanced in my heart. Because, I, I, of course, when the algorithm served up that old video of mine from 2017, of course I watched it. I wasn't paying any attention to what I was saying or anything like that. I was staring at my old girl uh, and just remembering, just realizing again from that. It's a weird thing about having your life on video is that suddenly there are reminders that you wouldn't get otherwise. That wouldn't, they wouldn't just randomly come across you otherwise. To have an, an impersonal algorithm on YouTube serve up a 30-minute video of my old male and more with with you can just see in the video how sick she is how old she is or at least i can but so and so this this helped a lot so I, i'm gonna i will link to uh to the bookish page 112 tag uh and i will sign off although i would love to know i have been a while since i did a page 112 tag if you want me to do more let me know and we'll do this if you think this is fun uh but anyway i'm gonna i'm gonna wrap this up uh but i will be back thank you booktube